Hey everybody, it's your episode 202 of At Percussion, and we're recording on October 20th. My name is Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual, we've got Carly Vigna. Hi everyone. And that's it. That is the, we are the total amount of hosts. Ben is gone, but it's for really good reason. He just c- completed his first triathlon. Did you see that, Carly? I did, yeah. Wow, I had no idea. I thought he was saying he was just seeing family or something. He probably did tell us, but that's amazing. <laughs> like, that's crazy. I knew Ben, I don't know, just like, so huge congrats to Ben. It's just clearly, you know, the way he wrote his little announcement that he did this. It's just clearly like such a huge personal accomplishment. And I knew Ben was really like, you know, exercising regularly and like really paying attention to some of those things. But he had this like nasty spill on his bike once not that long ago and i don't know i was just really surprised to see like holy cow he just did a triathlon way to go ben yeah that's cool yeah yeah way to go go. yeah way to go buddy i i'm gonna consider this absence excused it's very good so (laughs) you you guys our guest today she's a dma student at a little school you might have heard of called uc san diego studying under the very famous and uh past apricotion guest steven schick And she's enjoyed a wide-ranging freelance career over the last decade, performing in solo, ensemble, and theatrical settings in Australia, China, Canada, the Netherlands, Sweden, England, and Mexico, and the United States. I met her, I think we decided about eight years ago while she was studying in Fairbanks, Alaska, with another guest we've had, Morris Palter, who is also a former Stephen Schick student. And I definitely want to ask her about studying with the two of them and uh, lots of things. So, hey, Fiona Digney, how's it going? Excellent plus, as Steve Schick would say. <laughs> Excellent plus, is that what he says? Excellent plus, yeah. He says it's the, what's the, like the daily average and the highest possible score. <laughs> oh, that's cool. He is so positive. Do you ever catch him on like a really bad day? Oh, you know, I think we, we all have moments of being stressed out, but, uh, one of the things that I respect about him the most is that he he always seems pretty cool, calm, and collected. Yeah, yeah, I would I would say the same. Yeah. Do people often ask you like immediately once they hear your voice, say like, "Oh, you're from you're from England, right?" They screw it up. Yeah, yeah, quite a few people do, but that's okay. <laughs> my my accent is. Um, not as Australian as it is when I'm in Australia, and it's is not that as right? Australian as it used to be. Yeah, when I'm around other Australians, it definitely comes out. Uh, but Americans don't understand the full Australian accent as well, so uh, it's a little bit moderated when I'm in the states. Uh, but it is interesting. I was I did a performance last night, and a bunch of people came up to me after the performance and like welcomed me to San Diego and like welcomed me to America. And I was like, yeah, I've been living here for like <laughs> eight nine years now. So. <laughs> but it was it was very nice. But one day I will probably end up with a proper American accent. Hey, can can you remind me? Because, yeah, eight eight years ago in Fairbanks, Alaska, approximately, what have you been doing since then? And I don't know, maybe just give us like a short chronology of your education, I guess. Yeah, right. Uh, Well, my um, path up until now has been anything but straight, which I think is fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Um, But basically, I did my undergrad in performance in Australia at the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts. It's a conservatory over there. It's where Hugh Jackman studied, bizarrely. Um, Wolverine, that's Wolverine, right? It's also there, yep. Uh Uh, And then at some point halfway through my undergrad, I got a job as a music teacher and percussion teacher um, at a British international school in Shanghai in China. And so I went and did that for a couple of years and then came back to Australia to finish my undergrad and then I did a graduate diploma of education. And then around then was when Morris had come to Perth, Australia, where I'm from and had done a workshop and performance and uh, we took him out for a beer and I was chatting and he said, oh, you know, if you're looking for a master's degree, you should come to Alaska. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> Why not? Because uh, in Australia, we don't have teaching assistantships like we do in the States. And so the idea that I was going to get paid to live in Alaska, get a master's degree and teach at a 
undergraduate level as part of that deal, uh, which just blew my mind. I was like, why, why would I say no to that? So I was in Alaska from 2010 to 2012, and then I got into Code Arts, which is a conservatory in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and I went back to Australia to see family and friends on my way back up to the Netherlands. Uh, and it was the first and only time in my life that I'd um, relied on outside funding, you know, funding that wasn't made from my own work. Uh, and that funding fell through. And so I didn't get to go to the Netherlands. And the uh, only way to get around that and to make enough money to be able to get back out of Australia was to uh, take up a job with a friend of mine who happened to uh, have a company that worked on mine sites. And so I was an asbestos expert on a mine site in rural Australia for a year uh, wow. and didn't play any music at all for, for a whole year. And that was a very strange but awesome experience. I was wearing a hard hat and steel cut boots every day out in the desert. Uh, yeah, and then I went to the Netherlands and then I did a show, a theatre show in London and then made my way down to California for the doctorate. So when you started with Morris, and by the way, I just loved visiting you all way back then. I mean, it just it just seemed like you all were such a tribe. Yeah. You know, you're in this remote place. You're studying this very specific type of music with Morris. And it, it just seemed like such a wonderful thing. But I was going to ask... Did you already know you had that interest in that particular brand of solo percussion playing, which is, of course, the Steve Schick brand of repertoire? Or did Morris really, is, is he responsible for that more? No, like, I already knew that that's what I wanted to do. I remember when Morris came to Perth and I had a lesson with him, the two pieces that I played in that lesson, I think, were Temas Carl and 13 Drums. You know, so I was already kind of doing that sort of repertoire uh, and there weren't too many people, although there are some now, there weren't too many people in Perth doing that sort of repertoire at the time. And so I always knew, but I met Steve when I was... I think 18 in my first year of my undergrad, Steve came to Perth uh, as a guest artist and we played drumming and it was the first time I'd ever played drumming and I got to play like across the Marimba from Steve and it was this really amazing experience. And so um, I think that around that time was kind of when, when I knew that that was the direction that I wanted to go in rather than orchestral or rather than mallet playing. But even in high school, I knew that I would never be a mallet player like you, Casey. You know, <laughs> it was just not not on the cards for me. Um, yeah, so I, oh, I guess I've geez. known, known for a long time. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. Very, very, very cool. So I guess I guess the next natural question would sort of be like, what was it like studying with Morris? who, and I don't want to undersell Morris, I mean, he's more than just a Steve Schick copy, you know, he's more than just a Steve Schick student, of course, I mean, Morris has his own, all his own interesting things, but I guess studying that repertoire with Morris, and then these years later, studying it with Steve Schick himself. Yeah, uh, well, so my, my undergrad teacher was an orchestral player, and so... Uh, although I got a really well-rounded undergraduate education, it was really refreshing to go and study with Morris, who, who didn't have that, you know, background. He had the background of a of a drummer, and so uh, that was really that was really nice to have such a wildly different experience. You know, not only was it geographically very different to Australia, but to have um, such a huge pedagogical difference between my undergrad and my graduate and. In my undergrad, there, at the time, there wasn't a master's degree at all. And then in Alaska, we only had four, I think, master's students at the time and like two or three undergrad students. It was a very, very small program. Uh, yeah, and so, and then one of the great things about Steve, I think, is that he he really encourages all of his students to and not only encourages, but it helps them figure out what their thing is. So he really doesn't want his students to be like him. You know, he wants mm -hmm. his students to be them. Uh, and so although there's, you know, you can see a lot of similarities between Morris and Steve, like Morris is definitely Morris. You know, he's he's got his own things going on. Um, yeah, and they have quite different 
uh, different teaching styles in some ways, but then there's little things that come up. I was talking with Steve just last week, I think, and he, he said, well, you know, think about what is gained and what is lost with with that. Uh, and I burst out laughing because, of course, that's something that Morris says because he, you know, picked it up from Steve many years ago. And so... <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so there's lots of nice, nice things like that where it's it's I kind of like being part of a lineage and I've been thinking about lineage a lot lately and realized fairly recently that I, I've done the same thing twice so my high school teacher was an old student of who was then my undergrad teacher and then my master's teacher was a student of my doctoral teacher oh right wow yeah yeah, yeah, yeah like so nobody like gets to do two like that teacher. yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, Fiona, you know, one of the things that I always think about with Morris Palter, like we know him as such a like champion of contemporary percussion. And I remember the first time that I met him, he came to University of Maryland when I was an undergrad there and he, he performed Bone Alphabet and I had never heard anything like that. And it's just like, wow. But but actually recently I've I've had um, several students that are working on xylophone rags and I'm telling them go and look up recordings and guess who's in so many of the re cool recordings of xylophone rags and just that yeah. like that the the whole improv tradition and everything did you get to study also xylophone rag playing with with Morris when you were there Yeah we did a little bit of that um, I had also done rags in Australia in my undergrad program it was kind of part of the program that everyone I think in their second year would do a ragtime solo um, with like the marimba quartet behind which was always a lot of fun uh, and so I'd, I'd done a couple before I got to Morris and then I think I only played one when I was in Alaska because I was only there for two years and you know it seems when you start something like that it seems like it's going to be a long time and it's over before you know it yeah that's that's the master's degree I think that's yeah. what everybody oh, says so, you, you yeah. start it and then you're already thinking about what am I doing after mm -hmm. I I mean the first semester with my new new um uh Reese Maltzby's our new uh fully assist uh, assistantship GA for the marching band and we're already talking about where he's gonna go to grad, like where he's gonna go next because it does it just flies by like he's it's already on his radar you know yeah yeah, I don't yeah know it if takes that's time good to get all the application materials together and then of yeah. course you put the applications in usually by the first of december like almost a full year before you go on. yeah well yeah. so i guess yeah something i was thinking and i think you already answered it fiona because you, you said you already have this connection with steven Schick, and it's totally within the lineage that you want to follow and your rep so i guess the questions for for both y'all but if we could loan any advice to some younger listeners about just like how do you pick the next school and whether it's a master's program or a, a especially a doctoral program is probably the, the big one yeah oh that's such a big question because it's so there's so many facets to that right so one would be what do you want to be doing in 10 years what's your life look like in 10 years and and it's not only what job do you have but what lifestyle do you want to have in 10 years some people um find it really stabilizing and helpful to have a nine to five job where like you have health insurance and you have holidays and you have weekends and and that's great and if you're into that that defines a number of career paths for you already if you're like me and actually really don't like having um, a boss or a set schedule or you know and I can work um, very intensely or intensively for a short or medium period of time so anywhere between like two weeks and 12 weeks of like seven days a week, 16, 18 hours a day. Like I can, I can do that as long as I know I have like a two week break at the end of that, um, where I can just do absolutely nothing. And so if that's the sort of lifestyle you want, uh, and if you always want new projects coming up, uh, that also gives you a, a, a bunch of things that you could do. And it also, um, negates a bunch of other things. And so, yeah, so I think it's it's a good idea to be thinking about what you want to do in 10 years because when you think about that and what sort of lifestyle you want to have, do you want to live in a rural area? Do you want to live in a big city? Do you want to be freelancing? Do you want to be teaching? Do you want to be playing? How much of your time do you want to be spending doing arts administration because we all are moving more and more towards being this 
and this. And that's, I think, a really good thing. You know, more and more um, young musicians are performing and composing. More and more classical musicians are improvising again, which, of course, you know, we all used to do hundreds of years ago, but like <laughs> for some reason in the 20th century, we decided that wasn't a thing anymore. And so, um, yeah, so I thinking about what what you want to do and like academia isn't for everyone and it doesn't mean anything really if you if you choose to do academia or you don't um if and also you can do a doctorate degree not for the purpose of getting an academic position afterwards um but just for the fact that you love learning and you and you love learning in a scenario of a of a doctoral program um in terms of like specifically what school to go for ask around ask like you know i'm probably not the best person to ask this question to given that i'm australian and you know, <laughs> haven't grown up here um but from what i understand right there's there's some programs that are more academic and some programs that are more practice based um again like what sort of scene do you want to be in because the and what sort of like financial situation do you want there are some programs that i've heard about in america that are really great financial programs but maybe the geographical location isn't ideal for you because you're going to be there for like four to six years i'm starting my i've just started my sixth year of the doctorate somehow that happened uh and yeah. so yeah like you gotta think okay well what you're not going to just be at school. You'll probably be playing gigs, trying to get into a scene and all of that. So where do you want to do that? So, yeah, yeah. There's, I think there's so many questions to to consider when you're thinking about what school you want to go to. Um, I would encourage people to think long term to also develop, if you don't already have um, a group of mentors, people who are a bit older, a bit wiser, who you admire for whatever reason. They don't even need to be a percussionist or um, in the music field, uh, but just people who have some life experience and you you trust their opinion and talk these things through with them and ask them how they decided on their career path or on their um, when they moved to a different state or a different city. I have a great group of mentors that I regularly ask all these questions to and check in with them and and you know I say well what do you think what do you think I should be doing because <laughs> it's really it's really helpful uh you know if, if someone says oh yeah that t-shirt looks great on you 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 may agree with them you may not agree with them but that information helps you decide what you want to do yeah it's funny like I I can I can't repeat it's something we've all done we've all gone to a lot of school yet yeah, it's like we don't have a ton to say regarding this topic, you know, like, or at least we're not very specific. I mean, I think the the advice I remember was, well, like Fiona said, think about the career you want to have and where you want to be, and then look at teachers who have put students in that position, and that's a good starting point, you know. So if you want a symphony orchestra gig, look at people who have symphony orchestra gigs and who they studied with and did what schools did they go to, et cetera. And yeah, I don't know. Carly, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, the only thing I, I really have to add that hasn't been said is is the relationship that you have with the teacher that you're with is, you know, I think of primary importance for every every level, but especially if you're doing a terminal de degree, like you said, could be could be three or four or five or six or more years, um, and the the relationship that you have with that person, they're going to be the person helping you get, you know, basically any opportunity or employment um, after school or even while you're still in school. Um, so that's really important, of course, that you have a good connection with them and you like the way that you interact with them and and that it's just a positive positive relationship. Because we've heard yeah. the horror stories. We've heard the really difficult stories out there where they don't yeah. get along. Yeah. I would add, I guess, you know, perhaps a helpful way to answer the question would be to explain how I ended up at UCSD. And partly it's from meeting Steve and um, wanting to study with him because of who he is as a person and a educator and a writer and a player um at all of all of that and the well-roundedness of him as a artist is uh was really attractive to me i was like that 
I, that's what I want to do. I don't want to just play really well or, you know, whatever. So that was part of it. And then the other part of it was um, geographical location didn't matter to me at all, really. Like, I'd, I never went to Alaska before starting my degree there. I never went to the Netherlands before starting my degree there. I never went to California before starting my degree there. So <laughs> I just I just turn <laughs> up and start. It really doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I did look into the doctoral program at UCSD. Um, one of the things that I've discovered is like qualifying exams are very different degree to degree or like university to university. So yeah. it yeah. seems like a lot of... Um, so I know like ASU, there's like comprehensive exams where you do, it's like an actual comprehensive exam of music history and percussion and, you know, and it's pretty intensive. That is not for me. Like I'm, I would probably fail that comprehensive exam. <laughs> um, but the, you know, like, and of course in my master's degree, I, I had to do one of those. And so I did pass once. But I'm very happy to not do that. You know, again. you know your Palestrina and your yeah, exactly, yeah. And I could sit down and, and tell you the like history of opera in 20 minutes, and you know all of all of that. Or I could at one point. I don't know if I could right now. Um, but that was my next see... question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm having uh, connection problems. Um, <laughs> But then at UCSD, the qualifying exams are quite different. So you have your five committee members, you sit down and you talk to them over in the space of a year or so about three areas of research that you're interested in. And they can be whatever you like. Um, and over the courses, course of a year, you do some reading and you maybe do some writing and you talk to the talk to your point person professor about it. And then when you're ready to do your qualifying exams, um, your three of your five committee members submit questions and you go to the music office and they give you an envelope and it has all of it has the three questions in it and they time stamp it and you have I think 12 days exactly 12 days to write three papers so you write the responses to these questions and sometimes the questions are totally on to um, you know they're totally exactly what you were talking about with the professor and it's not a surprise and you've got half the paper kind of written already sometimes it's a really left of field question and and it can be pretty stressful but so you have this like 12 days of intensive writing where people lock themselves away and you know will be writing for yeah. 16 hours a day and then you hand in your your three large you know 50 page ish papers and then you defend them four days later right. and I found that really interesting because it's just three very specific topics that you're interested in it's I find it much easier to study for that and write about that so that, anyway, that's a long story, but it's um, something else to look into. Like what, what is the program right. about and what's it setting you up for? Because it seems like some doctoral programs are deliberately setting their students up to be educators in an education university. Other universities, you know, there's like research universities and education universities and so, and conservatories, like which one do you want to go to? So. Well, I remember taking that into consideration for sure, having watched, I, I remember specifically my friend Craig Hauschold from Rice University doing his doctoral degree, and he was studying for his comprehensive exams, and I, I was, how the heck do you even start? And he said, I'm literally reading the Grove Dictionary. Yeah. And he literally was. <laughs> and, and to me, I just thought like, but like, you can't retain all that, or can you? And I guess he was doing it over a very long period of time, and yeah, he, he passed, he got out of there, and but supposedly just very, very hard exam. But I remember thinking to myself, like, yeah, I, I don't see myself ever doing that. Like, am I capable of that? I mean, yeah, I guess so. But I don't see that. Yeah, I, I don't see m me putting myself up to that task. You yeah, know? I read the Taruskin when I was studying for my master's comprehensive exams. I just sat there and was reading Taruskin all day. <laughs> well, well, it's like, interesting read, like, fine, but yeah. It's, wow, I, and you know, I, I, it's a longer conversation perhaps for another day, but I, I have been thinking for a while about uh, tertiary education and and how it needs to needs to go through some pretty significant overhauls because we don't learn the same way that we did 100, 200 years ago, and we don't have you know we don't have the same. You need mentors, I think, rather than like a singular professor at the front who 
gives you all of the information. Like we've got Google. We don't we don't need to be relying on a singular person to give us all of the information. We need to, um, I think, have like smaller classes where it's more of a mentorship thing and teaching people how to research, teaching people how to think critically, and yeah, instead of just giving information. But anyway, well, this Very is cool. all this is all really good information because it's things that before I started the DMA, I didn't know about qualifying exams and comprehensive exams and yep. paper defense and anything like I didn't know how the program at University of Miami compared to the other schools I was applying to or or anything so that's that's a like hugely big point of what do you want your degree to be like do you want it to be mostly performance based or very research based or you know is philosophical dealing with it, with this aesthetics and all of that yeah I think a lot of up. people you know when you finish college, for instance, all you've ever been is a student. I think a lot of people go to that next degree because they just literally have never been anything else. You've always just been a student. So yeah, you just yeah, you just kind of keep going. And you know you like music, you know you like playing. But anyway, it's just really, really great, great thoughts. T time is really flying by. So I think I'm going to move us on to... God, kind of uh, interesting thing that happened this week, or at least it appeared on social media all over the place this week. And thanks so much, Ben, for uh, submitting this question. And uh, let's see. So uh, Ben from the podcast says, there has been recent social media backlash over a drum pad company. They shared some previous ads of highly sexualized imagery. While this is strange for any music company, it is especially odd and disappointing from a company that largely markets to young audiences. It is so wonderful to see representation from talented female percussionists across the board. Sheila E., Keiko Abe, Patty Nimi, Carly, and you, to name a few. Uh, thanks, Ben. That's very nice. What <coughs> message would you like to send the next generation of talented female artists who may be disappointingly facing sexism in 2019 and uh, beyond? Right. Uh, okay. Another, like, big question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And it, you know, it's something that came that has come up in an interview that I did recently, and it's something that I've spoken with people about. But it, it's not something that being a female percussionist in does, is not something that occupies my brain a lot, and it never has. Um, I I didn't know about this company um, and until today, uh, and I I hadn't seen the ad campaigns until today either. Um, but man, some like bad decision making for that company. like why would you call them muffs in the first place like <laughs> you can <laughs> someone went oh we should call them muffs oh and then we can like put a naked lady on there and wouldn't that be hilarious like no it's not it's not hilarious and well, and, well, well yeah. interestingly enough so apparently it's a company of women i i <laughs> Apparently, that's they, what was posted. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's something yeah. they said, and I was able to share that with. Gosh, I don't even know where I saw it. I mean, I just, you know, oh, good, something dramatic, and people are fired up about stuff. Let's follow it. But um, yeah, apparently, and again, if if anyone, I mean, any any listeners and from the company want to come on the show and <laughs> to tell us tell us what's what, that's that we would welcome that, or at least I would welcome that. Uh, but anyway, please continue. But yeah, I, I did okay. see, well, okay. I did see that they said it's primarily owned and run by 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 female percussionists. And in fact, the the person in the photo is a a female percussionist. Um, right. Well, okay. So, I mean, I, I, I personally don't think that changes it a whole lot. Well, um, and you know, I, think, I don't think that changes it um, much. You know. Because right. it was conceived by women versus it was conceived by men, really? Sure. Yes. Yes. And I would say that in uh, men, there's so many angles to this, right? So yeah. so as a female percussionist, um, I believe as a, you know, as a percussionist, as a human being, it is, it's my right to represent myself however I want to represent myself. So there's that. Um, so if I want to go and do a performance in like some super sexy skimpy outfit, um, that is my choice and great. Um, however, if if it's true that they're marketing particularly to young um, young percussionists 
I think that that's inappropriate at best. Uh, the other thing that I was quite disappointed by was the responses from the company in the um, comments on Facebook. Yeah, I was disappointed so. by that. The, like, I, you'll probably have a better memory of this than me, Casey. But the, you know, the comments were seemed quite um, flippant, and um, you know, people were people were pointing out the problematic aspects of their ad campaign. And one of the responses were like, "Well, I'm sure our." Um, our customers have seen women in bikinis before. I saw that one, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, well, no, that like it, it is quite different. It's it's really different. Um and so yeah, I think it's disappointing as best at best, but um but I do think that, you know, if it wasn't a company trying to sell a product, uh, you know, I've I've seen female percussionists um uh put photos of themselves on Facebook for um, advertising recitals and concerts that I wouldn't put up of myself, but mm -hmm. I'm I'm not them, and I think that they should they should do whatever they want. So for for me, I um, have never thought of myself as a female percussionist. I've always just thought of myself as a percussionist. And when people describe me as a female percussionist. I'm like, well. Okay, but do we go around saying, "Oh, this male percussionist"? No, we don't. So, how about okay. we're all just percussionists and leave it at that? Yeah, yeah. Wow, really? Yeah, good stuff, Carly. What do you think? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a whole lot. I've been thinking about how it bothers me and why, and how I'm not sure if it would have, you know, ten years ago. I think they said they originally posted it like 2006, <laughs> and how things have changed since 2006. Um, and, and the big thing for me that stands out, like, like Casey and I were talking a little bit before we started today about how like sex sells everything. We see sex and advertising everywhere in our lives. And, and why does it seem so bothersome when it's in our industry, when it's in the, you know, our professional world. And I thought about it, um, for, for high school girls to see an advertisement like that, like that's alienating. That's like, you're sexualizing this woman and like she looks like me that's like me and and I remember feeling that way when I was in high school when I was you know in my high school drum line feeling like all the guys are talking about girls and women in these ways and I just felt like this is not a, a place for me um and that 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 I think when I was in high school I, I never would have been able to express it that way because I didn't realize all the forces that were happening you know um, directly and indirectly, but that's that's what I now reflecting back. That's what I felt like. This isn't a place for me, and this I don't have a role in this community. And and knowing too that that's a marching, mm -hmm. I think primarily a marching company, um, and that's historically not been a, a real welcoming welcoming environment for women. So, yeah. so, do, so do you think like high school Carly saw that and thought because I'm not that. I'm not welcome. Is that I mean? mean, I didn't see that advertisement in, you know, when I was in high I school mean, had or, or anything like that. But yeah, I think I, I would have thought like, where is my role in this, in right. this percussion field if that's, yeah. you know, th that's the way that women are seen or viewed or, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, I would, and, so, oh, sorry, Kelly. Go ahead. Um, so... And this is kind of a question because, again, like we don't really have marching bands in Australia, but I, I had a conversation, I think, with Steve actually a couple of years ago about, you know, uh, what's it like to be a female percussionist? And I was like, man, that there were more females in my undergraduate program than there were males. Um, and so in Australia, I don't we don't have the same disparity. And so we were talking about why that could be. And the marching band tradition we pointed to as potentially one of those things because from what I understand and can, can please correct me um is that as you said Carly like in high school it's kind of alienating for women anyway because it is this like hyper athletic and like virtuosic in the athletic sense um sport almost and uh it's at a time when like because of high school and what it's like to to be that age like women uh tend to leave sports when they're when they get to be teenagers because of things that are going on with them and they just like you know what i don't need to deal with sports and then but 
men tend to like need a bit more exercise at that age and so so there's already the women are already getting pushed out a little bit of this and then and percussion becomes this really like macho thing and so i i find that there are a lot less females in percussion in america than there than there are in australia uh and so yeah because of all of that and finding out that they um were marketing towards marching band and high schoolers it's like so clearly they knew they knew exactly you know they were deliberately going for the forgive me but like horny teenager in the marching band um which you know like yeah there's there's so many problematic aspects to that unfortunately but yeah like we we don't need we don't need this already alienating um field you know to to be any more alienating than it already is yeah sure one that always just breaks your heart when you hear that story of you know, female student, male teacher, and the student feels like, oh, my teacher really respects me because of my skills. And then something happens and they find out, oh, they were just interested in me, actually. And they don't actually like I didn't get this gig because of my talents or I was I got this gig because my teacher wanted to like hit on me more or something like yeah. and then you just you feel so bad for that person you know and I'm not saying that you know the ad is guilty of that or anything but it, it is definitely in the same territory and it just oh it just I don't know yeah yeah I think it's it's really horrible and and um having been one of those female percussionists myself it's it's horrible to experience that and I think uh, in our roles as educators and the like, kind of the older crew, um, we got to really watch out for our younger percussionists and look after them, both male and female, um, and also, you know, call out behaviour that we see as inappropriate and just call it for what it is. Don't don't try and brush it off as a once off or brush yeah. it off as much of a big deal. Like we we, it's everyone's responsibility, I think, to step in and say something because especially when you're on the receiving end of inappropriate behavior it's um it's you know the last thing that you want to do is um admit to yourself that that's what's happening and and you need other people around you to advocate for you and it just occurred to me I, I i purposely didn't say the name of the pad company but that's probably a bad idea because people won't they might assume it's the wrong pad company so they're called <laughs> uh, i think you say it zymox right i think is that what it looked like i think so yeah, yeah. zymox pad yeah because i don't want people to think oh we're talking about ip or something you know no it's this uh, brand called zymox and uh, i have to say i played one once actually my uh, a female student Paige Durr, had one Gosh, right before she left, and uh, man, they're really um, the most like high tech drum pad I've ever seen. They're almost too high tech. <laughs> like, wait a minute, this feels way good to play on. No drum feels this good anyway. So it's kind of a criticism and a compliment at the same time. Well, but it's good that they've got a good product. Let's just hope that their um, ad campaigns can improve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like they, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not only following it so much, but it sounds like they took it down and um, I, I guess they didn't respond. They responded defensively to the criticism, it sounds like, but um, at least they, yeah, I don't know. They they don't seem to be doing that. I, I have to say as like the, the only male in the conversation, it just, when I see stuff like that, and of course I've been seeing that, um, like Carly said, like my whole life, you know, I mean, it's like you're constantly being advertised like, hey, you're a stupid man check out this TNA, buy this, you know, I just feel like, do you think I'm stupid? You know, like, I feel like you're just talking down to me. I feel like you're, you know, it almost makes me just do the exact opposite. Like, if you think I'm going to buy that because of that, right. <laughs> I'm going to prove you wrong, you know? Um, yeah, I'm gonna try to overcome this thing that, um, unfortunately is in your biology, <laughs> you know, like, no, I'm not going to do that on purpose, you know? Yeah. Anyway, the thanks. Yeah, thanks for the thoughts. I thought it was it was just an interesting thing that really flared up and just seems like everyone was talking a lot about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I have um, thinking about representation of genders and women. Um, I have one article I wanted to share with with you all. Um, it's called the title is Barbie Crushers 
crusher of aspiration. Um, so it's it's talking about, it was in the Boston Globe about five years ago in 2014, and there was a study um, where two researchers had 37 girls ages four to seven play with some toys. They either played with a Mrs. Potato Head, um, a fashion Barbie, or a doctor Barbie, like a Barbie dressed as a doctor. Um, and after playing with the dolls, what they did was ask the, the children, the girls, um, they showed them photographs of 10 different careers and asked if they thought they could do those jobs and then if they thought boys could do those jobs. Um, so the, the study, and of course this is, you know, this is limited. It was 37 girls in the study, but it said the girls who played with Mrs. Potato Head reported that of the 10 careers, they could do an average of 8.3 of them compared to nine for boys. The girls who played with either version of the Barbie felt that only uh, felt two thirds as capable as the boys aspiring to only 6.6 of the careers compared to 9.5 for the boys. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the effect of playing with Barbie was so pronounced, the girls felt less capable of achievement, even in female dominated occupations, which I think is huge. Sometimes we, we underestimate what representation and what the images that we see in the media do to us subconsciously and especially to children and teenagers, I think. Um, I thought that was really striking. Since I read this article, I've been thinking about it all week, you know, um, what, is, what does this mean and what can we do for our students and for the next generation? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I even, I thought about one, one other way that representation has come to light in my life lately. I think last week I was talking about this Sousa concert that I played and actually yeah. in the, the Sousa band percussion section in that particular concert was actually four out of five female, which is, you know, relatively uncommon, kind of cool. Not, not something like I would, I would probably have remarked about, but um, after the concert, one of my colleagues who works with the, the drum line at one of the schools that I teach at, and he, like the next week, he was like, hey, my daughter was at the concert. And afterwards, she came up to me and said, like, I want to play the drums. I want to be a percussionist. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking, like, you know, she's had her dad her whole life as a drummer, as a percussionist. I um, never had that thought that, like, hey, I could play right. percussion. And then she goes to this concert and sees four women playing percussion. And now all of a sudden it feels like, hey, I could do that. You know, and mm -hmm. it's not it's not about like every young girl or every every teenage, you know, every woman needs to be a percussionist or needs to do something male dominated. But how powerful is that, that that just seeing seeing women doing something, you know, professionally made made this child feel like, hey, they're doing something and I could do that, too, because they look like me that, you know, I have that in common. Mm -hmm. Well, and it it, it kind of helps define representation. Like when people say representation is important, they're not necessarily saying representation is important because it balances the field and makes it fair for the people in it. It's like, no, you're representing the people like young people who are looking and being just able to envision themselves doing something similar. And at Gal, many episodes ago, my sister, uh, Allie, She's the vice principal in Salt Lake City. She talked about this a lot, like how it, when kids are at this like super tender age, it's so important that they see people who, as simple as can be, like look like them, are doing good things and are doing things that they can aspire to. And like, yeah, like just like your story, Carly. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks a lot, Carly. What was the test called again? The Barbie doll? What? Crusher well, desperation. <laughs> Yeah, the article. I wrote it down. The because article I is called I've heard about this study before, but I, I haven't read the article. Yeah, Barbie oh, Crusher cool. of Aspirations. So, Carly, I think you found a question about, uh, well, let's do this one. Can you uh, tell us any highlights from your experience with redfish, bluefish? Mm. Well, yeah. All of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> redfish, bluefish is great. Um, probably the... You know, the biggest highlight for me is a totally a sentimental one. So earlier I'd mentioned that um, when I first met Steve, we played drumming across from each other um, in Australia. And for anyone who's read his book in like the last couple of sentences of it, he um, he mentions playing drumming with Defying Gravity in Perth, Australia. That was the performance that, that I was uh, luckily part of. And so my first concert with Redfish Bluefish um, was 10 years later to the week uh, and we were in Mexico 
and we played drumming and I played across the marimba from Steve. So like 10 years to the week between when we first met and my first concert in Redfish Bluefish as his student, we played drumming. And so that for me has been the highlight. Um, just in June, we played um, Michael Gordon's Timber um, at Disney Hall uh, for the Noon to Midnight series, wow. it's like a new music marathon uh, and that was a lot of fun that was really great uh, Michael was there for our sound check and he came and listened and gave some feedback which was really nice uh, and that was just a beautiful performance having everyone walk around for that one and the previous year we played Grise there and we've done a lot of there's a, the composition program at UCSD is really great and so we've done a lot of premieres of UCSD composers work yeah it's just I feel like every Every year we do really fantastic projects that that are really exciting. And, you know, there's honestly been quite a lot of rep that we've played um, in the last five years that I hadn't heard of before, which has been really nice. And, of course, you know, there's so much rep out there. Like that's perhaps not so surprising. But, uh, yeah, some of these, like, larger sextet works. We did Persifasa recently. I think I feel like it was the second time we've done Persifasa since I've been here yeah so like and Bert Whistle Hobby Horse which was great mm -hmm. yeah so there's, there's like a, a lot of um a lot of great rep that we that we do all the time and we all you know the the fish all get a say in what rep we play so you're called just, fish yeah with the fish <laughs> <laughs> that's cute yeah so we at the beginning of the year or the end of the previous year we all bring forward ideas for our like dream rep pieces for the following year and then we make it happen the first my first year uh as a fish it was 2014 15 um and 2015 was the year that steve was the music director at the ojai festival in california and so that year was super heavy with percussion which was amazing so redfish bluefish went as one of the ensembles for the festival and ice from the international contemporary ensemble from new york were there also and that was just fantastic experience there was a lot of bullets and verez and ionization we did ionization of course and that was that was really good fun well speaking oh. of repertoire i'm not sure if i'm i'm going to pronounce this piece right but i was reading a review of m alone was that right oh yeah yeah <laughs> Um, I would love to hear more about that piece and the experience and, and if you, did you work directly collaborating with the composer for that? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so M. Alone, it's a kind of a play on words for um, Malone, who's a character in a Beckett text, uh, and that that commission, I commissioned Roland Ozé, who's a French um Composer, like killer percussionist, uh, and composer and theatre director and all around nice guy. Um, I had met him, I think, in 2014, and him and Steve have worked together for many years um, and are also good friends. And I can't remember how how it came about, but at some point I reached out to Roland and said, "Hey, like I'd love to commission you for." you know, a solo or a duo or like a concerto, like whatever you want, like what do you think? And and he turned around and said, great, I'll write you a percussion concerto. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. I'd, I'd never had any particular aspirations to perform a concerto in my life, though I, not really something that I was ever interested in. Um, but, yeah, and so he – he came to, I brought him to San Diego and we spent three or four days workshopping, like about two years before the premiere, um, workshopping ideas. And in two days, I didn't play any percussion instruments. Um, we worked with three chairs. And so it, we, we were just doing movement based improvisation on three chairs. So I don't have any theatre background. I don't have any dance background. I have absolutely nothing. Um, I don't even really have any improvisation background. And yet here I was for hours a day improvising movement on three chairs, um, you know, silently <laughs> to Roland. Uh, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons I wanted to work with Roland. I had um, worked on um, uh, Cargill's Dressur with him in 2014 in Banff and 
uh, he's he's just such a great director. You know, like you, he will get you doing things that you never thought that you would be comfortable doing and you just do them and it's great. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to work with him because I always kind of felt like I wanted to get into or just like explore the theatrical percussion area a little bit but didn't really know how to and I thought well you know if anyone's going to be able to help me this guy will definitely be able to help and so you know and then of course the opportunity to um work with two of my like percussion heroes like Steve Schick conducts the orchestra that it was premiered with and then Roland Mose um was of course there for the week of the performances and we did some intensive work together and so yeah we we had many meetings over Skype over the year talking about um parameters for what we wanted the piece to be and um and of course we started with this really really big idea and over over time that you know we would carve out things like a sculpture you know you're just carving bits off until you end up with the, the final product wow very cool well let's see more questions another one from ben he says i noticed one of your pieces in your repertoire is osvaldo goliath's marielle for marimba and cello i have long wanted to perform this underappreciated work i have to disagree with ben there i think it's it's a well-played work but yeah. i also went to a school that just seemed like it got played a lot there so yeah it's uh, a little bias there but uh one of the most gorgeous pieces in our repertoire i certainly agree there uh could you tell us a bit about preparing the work for performance and uh, especially if you've performed it with multiple cellists uh, yeah, so I've, I've only performed it twice. Um, last night was, was the second time uh, and it was with a different cellist to the first time. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about, about preparing it. It's kind of the, the same as preparing any piece, I think. Um, for me, it's a little weird because I'm not, I'm not really a marimba player and so, um, and so that always feels just a little bit strange to me to play marimba at all. Um, <laughs> but I do enjoy it when I when I get to play, especially when it's in an ensemble setting, I'm not, um, you know, playing with a uh, cellist was really good. The other piece that we played on the concert was, um, me and the cellist at least, was uh, Caroline Shaw's Limestone and Felt, which is for viola and cello, but someone had um, performed it. There's a YouTube video of someone performing it with marimba and cello. And so that's a, just a fun fun little five-minute piece. Um, but, yeah, for me, Marielle, um, it's... Yeah, it's just a, a beautiful piece and playing with different cellists. It's just like playing with different musicians in general. You know, everyone's going to phrase things slightly differently and have different ideas. And, and I really enjoy the process of um, working out how to play with a new person, regardless of what the context is. Very cool. Yeah. Do you know that piece, Carly? Yeah, I know it from Boston. Is that where you were thinking of that people played it a lot? It was at Rice that I knew. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was just one of those ones that I don't know. Someone someone played it at one point, and then yeah, people just just it just you know it spread. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, I was gonna say, Fiona, just a little. Can you tell us, like, especially for some of uh, you know, along the lines of taking a DMA program and just more things to consider. What are your, what are your duties? Cause there's some work that goes into there that isn't just awesome, creative activity all the time. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the work portion of my deal at UCSD involves teaching. Uh, and when you, uh, before you do your qualifying exams. Um, so when you're still doing your coursework, you are a TA. So you are um, teaching a section for a professor who is teaching the lecture. So maybe there's 200 people in the lecture and then you have a section of 30 students that is um, a, a more in-depth look at the lecture material. And then once you have gotten past your qualifying exams, you can apply to be an associate in. So an associate in, you are creating a syllabus and uh, delivering that syllabus as the professor. And so you write the syllabus, you write all the assessments, you give the lectures, um, and then you have your own TAs. And so currently, so I've, you know, I've taught um, 21st music, 21st century music history, the generalized Western history of Western music um, class, uh, symphony class, 
And all of these, at UCSD at least, are uh, general education classes. And so they're undergraduate students, um, a lot of them freshmen, who are STEM majors or some other major. They're not a mm-hmm. music majors mm-hmm. at all. So you're teaching these large music classes to non-music majors, which is it, um, really interesting in its own challenge. Uh, at the moment, I'm teaching a class. Uh, I was asked to teach a pop music history class, and it could be whatever I wanted. So I was like, "Great, Australian pop music history, it is." So uh, I'm teaching that. And it's a, a what does that sound class. like? Um, ACDC, Sky Hooks, Olivia Newton John, Kylie Minogue. ACDC from Australia. France Joy. Yeah. Wow, I had no yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah, like the, uh, yeah, Tame Impala is probably like the biggest one, but Flume, Vera Blue, they're all Australian. Yeah, so so it's like a three-hour lecture a week, and I um, I love it, like because of the amount of times where it's like, oh, I bet you didn't know this one was Australian. Wow. And, uh, That's rad. Yeah, and yeah, it's just it's a lot of fun, and I have three TAs, and um, there's two other Australians in the music department at UCSD currently, and they are both. TAing my class, which is cool. So, <laughs> so we have all of these Australians teaching Australian music history, or well, Australian pop music history. Yeah, so it's it's um as a TA, it's like a ten hour a week commitment, and as an associate in, it's like a twenty hour a week commitment. Although usually it takes me a bit more than that to prepare for the lectures. So you've studied and taught music in a lot of different countries. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit, I don't know, try to get specific, like what happens really good in Australia that doesn't happen good here and vice versa Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And like what could we learn from how it's done in Australia and and so forth? That's an excellent question. Um, It's hard to answer because it would require me to make like a lot of generalizations based on information I don't know, right? So, um, like, I can tell you what my experience at my particular school in Australia compared to my particular experience at my particular schools, you know, in America. Um, So one thing that, um, that I really appreciated in my undergrad was a really great oral professor. So we did um, Kodai style oral lessons and a lot of them uh and so my oral skills were just fantastic as an undergrad and that served me really well um the other thing in percussion um, pedagogy was my undergraduate teacher tim white as being an orchestral guy he was very into technique and we would spend a lot of time getting our technique really solid. And um, every other place that I've been to around the world, I always get comments from, or I always did get comments from teachers saying, oh, well, the technique's really good, so that's great. We don't have to spend any time on that. We can get straight to the music. And I was recently back in Australia um, at my old school as a guest artist. And, cool. uh, you know, you, you get lots of undergrads being like, oh, technique, you <laughs> I don't want to play snare drum anymore. Uh, And I said to them, like, look, do it. It's so worth it because um, for me now and, you know, like my mid-30s, I don't think about technique anymore Mm -hmm. really because because it's so ingrained in my playing that I rarely have to adjust my technique or work on my technique to be able to achieve a certain musical or logistical thing that I need to do because I already have – all of that in my hands um and that's because you know i spent so much time like in especially in high school actually just like spending hours doing single stroke rolls just to <laughs> just to get the technique in the muscle memory so that i never have to think about it again um and so it's it's so much easier to spend that time now as an undergrad than it is to fix technique mis- technique mistakes later um and undo bad habits you know Yeah, sure. Well, y'all, we're sort of coming to the end here, and I thought I'd let you know what happened this day in history we're releasing on November 7th, and something very percussion-y happened. Usually it's hard to find very percussion-y things, but in 1986, Reflections on the Nature of Water was premiered. This is the famous 
concert that Ben has, I know, reported on when Autumn Island by Roger Reynolds was also premiered. And of course, Bill Mersch performed Reflections on the Nature of Water in the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. with a, a grant from NEA. So that happened on November 7th when we're releasing. So show off to your friends and or be embarrassed by knowing that to your friends. And uh, another one, this was interesting, I did not know this, but during a broadcast of a piece called Song of the Youths by Stockhausen, uh, Ligeti, the other composer Ligeti, Igor Ligeti, unlike his fellow Hungarians who were busy hiding in cellars, Ligeti went up to brave the explosions and shrapnel of the attack that was happening and uh, stays above ground to hear the radio of uh, this broadcast of Stockhausen's piece. And I thought that was really cool and just reminded me, you know, how easy it is now and how back then something like that was so rare and valuable and Ligeti actually wanted to hear the piece that bad that he was willing to uh, put himself in harm's way. So, uh, yeah, this piece by Stockhausen is... Uh, I guess regularly cited as one of the first masterpieces of electronic music, although created in 1955 to 56, it seamlessly blends. And I listened to it. I totally agree with this. It blends uh, a lot of the pitch material of the electronics with the pre-recorded voices. And it's really seems advanced. I mean, I always kind of thought of Poem Electronique as the first pure electronic tape piece we talk about. But this does predate it, and it does sound quite more advanced to me. So it was originally conceived in five channels, voices, and for some reason later reduced to four. But I didn't figure that out. But that broadcast and that story with Ligeti happened on November 7th. So that's what I dug up this week. And, man, Fiona, thanks so much. You're so cool, everything you're doing. And um, it's great to like catch up with you all these years later. Yeah, as are you, and thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to chat, and I always find, you know, when we, when you have these interview-type chats, you end up having these great conversations that it's like, oh, I wish that we were just having these conversations all the time, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, every week. <laughs> every week. No, every I didn't week. see that. I was looking through all of the uh, previous podcasts, and I was look I went through and, and listened to or watched a couple of them, and I didn't see Steve's one, and I didn't see Morris's one, so I'm going to go back and find those two and check those oh, out. Oh, yeah. Yep, they're there. Yep. Well, yeah, thanks again, and thanks so much, Carly. Good to see you, as always. Yeah, thanks so much, Fiona. It was great, great chatting Thank with you, you, meeting you. Cool. Absolutely. All right, everybody, we'll catch you on number uh, 203. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.